Wilder is telling members of the House Natural Resources Committee that officials will be ready if the top fuel trial is either called off or fails. If it does not work, then there is a plan B to move forward with uh, a cap on the well that hopefully will result in the controlling of the pollution that currently continues to spew uh, out into the Gulf Coast. Committee Chairman West Virginia Democrat Nick Rahal says the hearings were designed to find out if BP has been shrugging off safety concerns in its offshore drilling operations. And as crews try to find a way to stop oil flowing into the Gulf of Mexico, President Obama is pushing his agenda for alternative energy today. The President is touring a Northern California plant that manufactures solar panels. The company added workers after receiving funding from the stimulus program. New questions have been raised about the President's recent proposal to increase offshore drilling in the wake of the BP spill. Mr. Obama is scheduled to visit the Gulf Coast region on Friday to see how the area is dealing with the cleanup. The Commerce Department reports demand for commercial aircraft shot up last month in the U.S. and that fueled a rebound in orders for durable goods. It was nearly 3% in April. Danielle Carson reports it was the strongest showing in three months. Durable goods orders are the leading indicator for manufacturing, and the April report is the latest sign that the manufacturing sector is the star of the economic recovery. Commercial aircraft orders spiked a whopping 228% last month, a big chunk coming in for Boeing 777 aircraft. Chris Lowe's chief economist with FTN Financial. We're watching the aircraft orders particularly closely because Boeing has had some production issues, and every time they announce a problem, we see orders decline a bit, and then when they announce a solution like they did this month, we see these very strong growth numbers. The April report shows durable goods orders went up in other areas as well. Businesses and consumers are also investing. Orders for cars, computers, and other electronic equipment all rose. For NPR News, I'm Danielle Carson. As world markets continue to watch how the EU grapples with the growing debt crisis, U.S. Treasury Secretary Timothy Geithner is meeting with European government and financial officials this week. He met first with British officials, and now he's headed off to Germany to meet with the head of the European Central Bank. Meanwhile, the EU's top financial official says European banks should pay into a fund to protect taxpayers from having to cover future bailouts. The Dow Jones Industrial Average is up 73 points at 10,117. The NASDAQ deposit is up 26 points at 2237. This is NPR News. Support for NPR comes from LendingTree, providing customers with the ability to manage their money, credit, and loans all in one place at LendingTree.com. From 91.5 KJZZ News in Phoenix, I'm Terry Ford. Phoenix police are questioning a man they took into custody this morning after a police officer was shot and killed. Little is known about the suspect. The television video showed a man dressed in what appeared to be the hospital garb, handcuffed and removed from a police vehicle at a downtown police headquarters. Earlier in the day, police spokesman Sergeant Trent Crump said officers responded to a call of suspicious activity at a home on West Fairmont, that's near 19th Avenue and Indian School Road. As police arrived, shots were fired. The officer was struck. Neighbors said they heard numerous shots. Fellow officers transported the wounded officer who died at St. Joseph's Hospital. And the Federal Aviation Administration said today that a light plane has crashed at Chandler Municipal Airport. FAA spokesman Ian McGregor in Los Angeles says the Piper Cherokee crashed on the airport's infield between two runways just before 9 o'clock this morning. Two people on board, they both survived. The passengers suffered serious injuries. The pilot suffered minor injuries. He went to preliminary information. The investigators are on the scene at the Chandler Municipal Airport. And some Arizona cities are concerned about the potential loss of a tax incentive that attracts the film industry to the state. KJZZ's Lynn Kelly has that story. The tax incentive bill made it through the Senate and through the House Commerce Committee, but died on the legislative sessions last May. The president of the Arizona Film and Media Coalition, Michael McGinn, says the end of the tax credit would put the state at a huge disadvantage in attracting film industry business. According to the Arizona Republic, motion pictures, video production, and sound recording are a $1.5 billion industry in Arizona, supporting more than 12,000 jobs and generating nearly $50 million a year in state and local taxes. Bill supporter Representative Anna Tovar from Tomlinson says she and others are hopeful the bill will be resurrected in a special session before the tax incentive expires at the end of the year. For KJCZ, I'm Lynn Kelly. I expect to reach 95 in Phoenix today, right now 80 in KJS. KJZZ is supported by the Phoenix Symphony presenting Patriotic Talk, a Memorial Day salute to America, with Susan March's music from Richard Rogers' Victory at Sea and a music.
musical journey of the U.S. Armed Forces song, Phoenix Symphony Double Work. I'm Diane Marie. Little B by Chris Cleese tells the story of a teenage Nigerian girl's attempt to escape from the men who massacred her village. Oil, politics, and ethnic warfare simmer in the background of the narrative. When the title character, Little B, it's an educated white couple on the Nigerian. And hopeful, the novel explores what people are willing to do or not do to save others and themselves. Joining me in the studio for this month's Reader's Review, Nigerian-American journalist Dayo Olapade, Joel Charney of Refugees International and Creative Writing Instructor, Lisa Page. I do invite you to join us. This book was so highly recommended to us. I hope you've read it, but if you have not, join us with your questions, comments. In any case, 800-433-8850. You can send us an email to the R show at WAMU or join us on Facebook or tweet. Good morning to all of you. Good morning. Good morning. Dio, tell me how you reacted to the book, Little B. Well, I think the book is an incredibly strong piece uh, of journalism, which is, of course, uh, my profession. Uh, and it's about trying to tell a story in a way that gives the most impact and the most weight um, to the political and cultural issues that surround it. Um, and it's a remarkable achievement in that it does so. It uh, dances around the complicated politics of Nigerian oil production and immigration policy in England. And it does so through the lens of two really well-drawn characters who pass the narrative back and forth between them chapter to chapter, which I thought was a really wonderful device and underscored the way that these two women have become connected and are sharing the same story, trying to tell the same story. Um, in a way that has the most impact for the reader. There is a significant age difference between the two women. Yes, I thought that that was um, the two convers the conversations that go on between Little B and the, uh, the other protagonist, David Sarah, who was a journalist in England, um, were very, uh, very serious, I thought. I thought that the two women related to one another, sometimes at Little B's level, and she's, you know, very precocious. Old, and sometimes with the register of a 30-something woman who uh, has, has had a lot of life behind her. And I enjoy the seeing the two of them um, interact um, as equals in many respects. Maybe to pay, you how did you forget? Well, you know, what really strikes me about these two narrators is um, that they're both women. They're women responding to this international story. Um, disaster, war, uh, power, violence and what happens to women as opposed to men on the battlefield. Um, and that choice um, in terms of the narrative was outstanding to me. It, it drove the story in a way that made it a complete page turner. Because, as you say, what happens to women in this story is clearly violence by rape, by torture, by the worst possible kind of treatment. And women are vulnerable because of their children, um, because of their families. That comes through throughout the novel. Joan Charney, as a representative at Refugees Center. I'm going to turn off the radio for a moment and move this just a bit, just so that you can see that I really am using the Google Nexus One card off. You can see that. Um, you can see that right here on the window. So. And then I just move it a little bit out.